Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slipbaum, and today we're talking about discovering the future. It's no secret that the history of aerospace power is full of technological competitions. In World War I, the basic discovery regarding aircraft designs, power plants, and basic construction techniques were so new that things seemed to evolve on a weekly basis. The Allies could have the advantage one month and then lose it a few weeks later when enemy technologies appeared out of nowhere. In World War II, this competition expanded. Not only was airframe design far more sophisticated, but piston engines were squeezing out peak power and then the jet appeared. Add technologies like radar, basic data links, ballistic rockets, and the scale of innovation was truly staggering. And we all know things simply accelerated in the Cold War thanks to the Century Series jets, the space race, advanced types like the SR-71 and XP-70, the rise of onboard computing power, and massive global transport aircraft. We had satellites in orbit and the advent of new materials like composite structures. And that's just talking about U.S. achievements. Remember, each one of these steps was driven by developments on an international scene. And the reason for this is utterly pragmatic. Airmen and Guardians have a defined set of missions to accomplish. They have a responsibility to get the job done in the most effective, efficient way possible. If our capabilities hold enough of an edge, we might be able to deter adversaries from challenging our interests. If war is inevitable, then we need to be able to accomplish missions decisively. Remember, it's not just in our interest to simply throw men and women into impossible challenges and then have them die. Miss a step on the technological ladder and you could find yourself on the losing side of war. Look at it this way. We all need the right set of tools to do our jobs. Mechanics fundamentally depend on the quality and precision of their tools, and sometimes they need a really specialized wrench to access a bolt buried deep inside of an engine. You don't have that tool, then you can't finish the job. The same holds true in nearly every field imaginable. We don't see too many Olympic runners competing in beat up worn out shoes or software pioneers relying on a decades old computer. So with that, I'm really excited to introduce Major Chris Olson to the show. He's an engineer in the Air Force and he has worked on some of the most sophisticated programs the service has in science and the technology portfolio. So uh, he's also served as a Mitchell Institute fellow this past year, and we have really valued his insights and perspectives. So Chris, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot for having me, Slick. Uh, I'm really excited to be on the podcast and uh, in front of the microphone. As, as I told my, my, my co-fellows, usually the, the majors are sitting on the wall while the generals do the interviews. So uh, this is really exciting for me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, you, but you're the ones that got the generals to the meeting, right, with all the notes that they'll be uh, going after. So um, again, happy to have you here. And I can imagine that, you know, the time time that we're living right now has to be truly exciting uh, in your career field with the Air Force and the Space Force always pushing forward. Uh, and obviously with peer competition on the rise, folks are really pushing for innovation. So how have you seen this play out in your career? Yeah, it is a really exciting times. Uh, so I commissioned in 2008. And in that time, I've seen a dramatic shift in the way the Air Force um, kind of uh, where we focus our science and technology. So in the beginning, we were laser focused on Iraq and Afghanistan when I entered service in 2008. And as you can imagine, the science and technology at the time was built around that fight, the low end fight. Uh, and since then, you know, fast forward to 2018, I was finishing up my PhD when the national defense strategy was released. And uh, that's when we started to see this dramatic shift away from focus on the low end fight to focus on the high end fight and this new era of uh, what we're calling a great power competition. Uh, it's like I, I tell my friends and family, the, the U.S. Was, was for the better part of 20 years focused solely on winning in Iraq and Afghanistan and kind of heads down and then looked up one day to realize our, our peers had not slowed down. Uh, and in fact, they'd used that time as an opportunity to chip away at our technological warfighting advantage. Uh, and so how I kind of saw that manifest during my time at AFRL, I, I got there summer of 2018. The lab was still kind of grappling with what does this new national defense strategy mean in terms of how we conduct the science and technology enterprise. And how it kind of manifested over the couple of years I was there was we went from funding numerous small scale research and development projects focused on things like counter improvised explosive devices and tactical ISR to consolidating that funding into larger programs focused on uh, what I call like kind of strategically important technologies or we or we called them transformational technologies like hypersonics, AI, quantum computing and autonomy. 
And, and excuse me, Chris, I should have also said that you are Dr. Chris Olson, uh, having completed your uh, uh, your doctorate in engineering. But uh, I, I want to ask you a basic question. Uh, just to figure out where you guys get your focus from, because, you know, for me as a combat pilot, I remember flying the airplane, you know, I'd want to ask the engineers a question or I'd have an idea of something that could be improved, but it's not like I can just send you an email and say, hey, can you fix X? So who tasks you and who rack and stacks the priorities that you get across your desk? Yeah, so that's a great basic question, Slick, and, and I wish it had a simple answer, but, um, you know, most things in s and don't. Um, so, uh, and, and I will just add real quick that sometimes the warfighters do send us emails at AFRL. <laughs> that's not the the uh, authorized process, but, but it does happen. Um, so before I answer your question, I kind of wanted to frame for our listeners uh, just kind of the, the broader context of science and technology. Uh, and there's really three types of s and uh, the first type is basic research. So this is what everyone thinks about when they think about the lab. These are the people in white coats playing with laser beams, pouring bubbling substances between beakers in the lab. Um, and, and that is really focused on discovering natural phenomena, basic scientific principles that we think might eventually be useful for a military application. Um, the second type is called applied research. So this takes the outputs of basic research And we try to harness it and turn it into new and exciting technologies. And these will really become the building blocks for future systems that are going to provide some sort of operational capability. And the third type is called advanced technology development. And I think that's the the, the piece that you're asking about. Because for the warfighters, that's really where the rubber meets the road. Um, That's where we start to assemble all of the technologies we've developed and actually build a system that is going to... uh, provide a military capability. Um, okay, so so between those three types of uh, research types, which one is tasked to you directly then? So the third type I talked about, advanced technology development, that's the one that the warfighters will task us with. But there's actually two types of advanced technology development. Uh, the first is called technology push. Um, and so that is when the warfighter has not asked for something, but there's an engineer it, or a researcher within the lab who has an idea that they think is going to be useful to the Air Force. It's going to solve some problem the Air Force has. And so they uh, pitch the idea to their chain of command, try to get funding, uh, and then use that funding to try and mature the idea. And once they do, they go shopping for a customer. So they take it to the, the major commands, to the warfighters, and say, is this useful? Would you agree to buy this technology and field it? Um, the kind of the quintessential example of technology push that everyone can understand, uh, which is probably a bit overused, is the iPhone. Uh, before Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone in 2007, nobody knew they needed a smartphone. And then after he unveiled it, everyone needed a smartphone. And fast forward 14 years later, and there's one in nearly every pocket in America. Um, so the, the, the key piece that really answers your question is what we call technology pull. And that is where the warfighter says... I need to be able to do X, but whatever X is, I don't have any technology in my portfolio currently that I can use to do that. And so they ask the science and technology enterprise to build it for them. And I I won't go through the the gory bureaucratic details, uh, but those requirements essentially come from the major commands. And sometimes the major commands generate them internally, and sometimes they're uh, they're, um, vouching on behalf of a combatant command that says they need it. Uh, and so eventually uh, S&T Enterprise gathers all those requirements from the major commands and they end up at a place called the Capability Development Council, which is an executive level board that, that uh, sits in the Pentagon, which will eventually decide how to prioritize all those s and programs and which ones to fund and which ones to leave unfunded. Okay, so uh, just a sidebar question here. A lot of times you hear or read about, you know, some really exciting technology development, but never makes it to the field. So what happens to that? Yes, so that is a a common phenomenon in science and technology, and we call it the valley of death. And it's by no means limited to the Department of Defense or defense technology. This is a problem that any kind of company organization involved in innovation is going to face. And that is when a technology looks really promising in the lab, and for whatever reason, it just never makes it into the field. Um, What usually happens is the, the operator or the warfighter will look at it and say, yeah, that's really useful, but I only have so much money I can only fund so many things, and all of these other things are more important, so I'm not going to buy that technology. 
And so the technology just perishes in the valley of death and it sits on a shelf somewhere in the, in the S and T community. And maybe someday it'll see the light of day again. I was going to say that's probably some pretty neat shelves to, to look at as far as what's uh, what's left there from you guys. Um, so uh, going on to another big question, um, a lot of the problems that you and your colleagues uh, track and, and tackle are just really complex. And, I, you know, look at uh, a lot that we've talked about uh, as a topic of hypersonics. And we've been looking at it for decades. Uh, historically, looking back at the X-15, uh, a manned rocket that uh, it flew Mach 6.67 in the 1960s. So uh, how does a technology portfolio like that advance? Uh, is it comprised of individual projects that fall under a specific application or how does that work? Yeah, I think you've really kind of captured the essence of it in your question. Um, so when we're looking at a technology filled with complexities like hypersonics, uh, it, it sounds easy, but it's not as easy as just slapping a, a bigger engine on an airplane and trying to make it go hypersonic, um, especially when you look at something like an air-breathing hypersonic cruise missile that we're developing today to, to um, be an effector for long-range precision fires. If you look at that problem, it's, it's so complex and difficult that we really have to break it into a bunch of smaller projects and programs uh, to get at the bigger problem. So you think about to fly hypersonic, you've got to have an engine to generate that kind of power. And you've got to figure out how to get enough oxygen and fuel into the engine to go that fast. So that's one problem. Now you've got this big engine that's generating all this heat, plus you've got heat from friction with the atmosphere. So now you have a heat dissipation problem. So you have to figure out how to get all that heat off the, the missile so it doesn't disintegrate on its flight. Then you have a problem of materials. you got to find a material that is can withstand the kind of stress and heat that the missile is going to experience, but is also not so heavy that the missile will no longer be able to fly at hypersonic speeds. Uh, you also have to control something going that fast, which is difficult because airflow is a lot different over a control surface at hypersonic speed than it is at subsonic. And your reward when you figure out all of those smaller projects and, and develop those technologies is now you have the hardest part ahead of you, which is integrating it all into a single system that's going to have the operational effect that you're looking for. Gotcha. So just understanding that it's basically about all the smaller efforts uh, coming together, you know, through various discoveries and one project might sunset and, you know, you might gain some knowledge and then apply it to, to something else. That's exactly right. You've you've really kind of captured the essence of science and engineering. Uh, I once had an undergrad professor tell me that teachers should always be smarter than their students or else we're going backwards. <laughs> well, thank you for that, doctor. I, I do appreciate the compliment. But uh, um, moving on here, if we want to accelerate, uh, you know, certain areas of discovery, what does that look like? Is it just more programs and more staff and more funding? Or, or how do you really get after uh, discovering a new technology? Yeah, so... Uh, uh, more funding never hurts, <laughs> as they say, no money, no program. Uh, but aside from getting the program funded, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's really all about priorities. Um, unless Congress just gives us overall more money to, to do science and technology, which doesn't seem likely in the foreseeable future, s and is going to be a zero-sum game. And so what that means is for one area of research to increase, another area is going to have to, to decrease. So we're going to have to make some tough decisions about um, which programs we want to keep going, which programs we want to start, and which ones we want to divest from. And that doesn't mean the divested programs aren't valuable. I, I think all research is valuable, but we just can't afford, we don't have the luxury of pursuing lines of research that aren't aligned with the goals of the national defense strategy. Um, so to me personally, I, I think the best way to accelerate discovery in an area is to get the best and brightest minds in the fields working for you. Um, and you can do that in one of two ways. You can buy it, which means you go out and contract for it. So um, this is nice because it's flexible. You can buy the expertise you need and only for as long as you need it. Uh, but it's not enduring. And, and so the more enduring way to, to build expertise, but also more costly, is to grow it internally, organically in the organization. And uh, to do that, though, you've got to invest in recruiting, development, and retention efforts. Uh, but the dividends it pays down the road is that, uh, especially in some of these technology areas that we're going to be pursuing for decades, like hypersonics, um, you build a cadre of experts within your organization that, uh, you know, most importantly, are going to go on to become leaders, and they're going to be the ones to um, build and guide programs far into the future. Yeah, no, that, that's a, a great perspective, and, and I appreciate it. And obviously, you know, growing uh, the leadership is, is going to be tremendous, uh, along with having uh, the capabilities. Um, shifting gears here for a second, I want to ask you about uh, the stand-up of the Space Force, because uh, 
I'm a little confused and, and I don't know if they're still part of the Air Force lab structure or are they creating their own? That's a great question. So uh, Major General Prinkle is the current commander of the Air Force Research Lab, and she was actually on an episode of uh, Aerospace Nation um, that Mitchell had not too long ago, and she used the motto, one lab, two services. So no, there's not going to be a separate space lab. Um, uh, as just a lowly major, I was not privy to all the conversations that went into this decision, um, <laughs> but I'll, I can tell you what, what my kind of understanding was, and that's that the Department of Air Force Leadership realized that on the whole, creating a separate space lab was going to create a lot of additional overhead costs and would actually kind of be more of a de- detriment to the, the Air Force Science and Technology Enterprise than a, than a help. Uh, okay. and, and that's because of all of the synergy between air research and space research. Um, the lab, for instance, has the directed energy research and material research. Um Those are areas that are equally applicable to both domains. So it it didn't make sense to create artificial bureaucratic barriers between the researchers. Um, So the Space Force is its own separate service. It determines its own S&T priorities. And then the Air Force Research Lab goes out and executes. Gotcha. Well, Chris, how did you get into this world of of S&T? Did you always want to be an engineer? You know, Slick, um, I, I always wanted to be in the military from a young age but I did not necessarily want to be an engineer. Um, I didn't really know what engineers did, to be honest. I, I thought all they did was build buildings. Uh, that's how kind of naive I was as a kid. But um, I was always really good at math and science. Those were always my two favorite subjects in school. So uh, when it came time to pick college degrees, I got out the academic guide and I read through the degree programs and looked at the courses and engineering just fit. I mean, I was excited to learn about all those different types of things. So um, that's how I picked engineering. And around the same time, I was trying to decide on an ROTC program. And I was actually kind of leaning toward Army ROTC when I entered uh, college. But another cadet who would later become my wife uh, said, why don't you go check out uh, Air Force ROTC as well and see what they're offering? So I did. And the Army ROTC at the time was saying, well, what's important is that you get an undergrad degree. uh, And how you perform in ROTC will kind of determine whether you get infantry or tanks or whatever. Um, the Air Force said, if you get an engineering degree and you don't become a pilot, uh, we're going to make you an engineer. So I liked that answer. That made me happy. And I never looked back. Oh, that, that's awesome. Uh, just thinking about this, when I first came in the Air Force, I enlisted first to get money for school and work on airplanes, which which I really enjoyed that time uh, because, I, you know, but I was just focused on wanting to fly airplanes. Then I never really saw the engineering side of it until I was, you know, essentially a customer of of the engineering, if you will. Uh, and looking through the, the pilot lens, I never really saw the opportunity for engineers to spend t- uh, time with uh, operational portions of the Air and Space Force. You know, I didn't have an engineer from AFRL, you know, hang out at the fighter squadron for a month at a time or anything like that. And and uh, I kind of see that uh, opportunity, you know, could go also go the other way because I've never visited an Air Force lab. Um, so what's your view on that? Do you think the system could benefit from uh, some sort of engagement uh, b- between uh, the engineering and like, you know, in my perspective, the uh, the fighter pilot community? Yeah, uh, you know, it's like you've, you've really touched on a really important point. And, and this is something I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about over the last couple of years as I've uh, reflected over the first half of, of my career, let's call it. So I entered the Air Force in 2008, and, and here's my personal story. So in the 13 years I've been in the Air Force, I have never been stationed at a base with an active duty flying squadron. Um, actually, the first time I sat down and had a conversation with an Air Force pilot was when I went to squadron officer school in 2014. So if you do the math, that, oh. was, that was after six years of active duty. Um, The second time was when I was a PhD student around 2016. I took a class where a master's student happened to be in the same class, and he was an F-22 pilot, and I just took the opportunity to kind of chat with him and pick his brain and get his operational perspective. The third time I had a chance to speak with operators was here at Mitchell Institute as a fellow. Um, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be uh, a co-fellow with two air battle managers and uh, a B-1 pilot, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Kimball, who was just on a recent episode of the podcast. Sure. Uh, so uh, if, if you look at all of those three instances, you can see that none of them were really in carrying out my primary duties as an engineer or a scientist. Um, they were all kind of the product of happenstance or one-off meetings uh, that were driven by professional military education courses. So uh, you might look at that and say, well, maybe you're just an outlier, Chris. Um, but from talking with 
lots of scientists and engineers uh, over the course of my career. I, I believe I'm not really an outlier that I'm probably closer to the, the rule than the exception. Um, and, and, and my perception uh, of, of how things are is that uh, operators and engineers kind of live in separate worlds, separate communities. Um, we speak a different language and we worry about different things. So I, I think we need more than just collaboration between engineers and operators. I think we need a way to develop mutual understanding. Uh, and, and really, I think the onus is more on the, the engineers than the, the warfighters. I mean, we're here to support the warfighters. Um, that's the whole reason our enterprise exists. So it's on us to come up with a way to truly understand what they need, what they worry about, what are the greatest challenges they're facing. There's a difference between reading a requirements document and knowing what their requirements are and understanding what they value. You really bring up a good point. And, you know, like I, I've known uh, through PME, like you mentioned, you know, uh, you meet people from other communities or occasionally you might have a pilot that, you know, either had an engineering degree or maybe uh, was doing some work with AFRL before they went to pilot training or something like that. So um, now that you've had a few touch points, uh, especially through your, your PME and being a fellow, uh, how are some ways you think we could increase this cooperation between the communities? That's a good question. Uh, at baseline, I think... We need to get operators who are out in the field performing the missions involved early and often in the science and technology process. Um, oftentimes, their involvement in a program will be we send them some PowerPoint slides uh, once every couple of quarters, and they look at them and say, looks good or doesn't look good. Um, we need their enduring presence on uh, in programs, and they need to be really part of the team. Um, and, and when I say operators, I mean operators who are currently active out flying and fighting today. Um, too often, the operator perspective is, uh, uh, you know, someone who's on the verge of retirement who hasn't been near a flight line or a jet in eight, ten years, or it's a, a, a retired reservist who, you know, hasn't last served in the 90s. That's not to say their perspective is not important, because it is, um, but it's not current. It's not the most relevant perspective, which is what I think we need to really get into the process. Um, but I'll go even one better than that, uh, better than just closer um, uh, working relationship. I think we need to blend operationally focused assignments into an engineering officer's career um, from the very beginning. Uh, in an excellent 2020 Joint Force Quarterly article uh, by Colonel George Doherty, he looks at different ways we can reform acquisitions, but one of the ones he talks about is the Israeli Talpiot program. This is a really cool program that the Israelis developed to develop an elite core of technically trained military officers who kind of understand both that operational perspective, but also how to develop science and technology. Um, I don't think the Air Force needs a program quite that intense or maybe quite that closely managed, uh, but I think they have the right idea. So to sum up what I'm trying to say, I think we need to bake the operational perspective into the scientist and engineer's career from the very beginning and not try to just tack it on at different uh, points during their career. All right, Chris, what about the broader uh, innovation ecosystem? Uh, obviously, we have uh, science and technology, research and development, and then tests. So can you walk us through what each of those mean and uh, what things are accomplished in each category? And do people move in between these worlds much? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned three things, science and technology, research and development, and test. And you can think of each of those things as steps along the road to maturing and fielding operational systems. Uh, I will add a side note here that the line between science and technology and research and development is in reality a little murky, but for the sake of the, having a good conversation, we'll just, we'll just go with it. Um, okay. Science and technology is, uh, you can think of as early research. So, and I touched on this a little bit earlier. This is expanding our knowledge. This is learning about those basic uh, natural phenomenon, those scientific principles that we're going to be able to harness in new ways to um, fuel future innovation. Um, R&D is more practical in perspective, and you can kind of think of R&D as standing on the shoulders of s and It is about building new products and systems. It's about taking the building blocks that we found and discovered in s and and turning them into new capabilities that are going to be some sort of useful to the warfighter. Um, test is about two things. So test is about verification and validation. So verification is very quantitative in nature. 
And it's about making sure that we built the system according to the specifications and standards. You know, if the doc, if the blueprint says it's supposed to be 50 centimeters wide, is it really 50 centimeters wide? Um, whereas validation is more of a qualitative question. It's, it's looking at this system we built, does it actually provide the capability the warfighter asked for? Is it going to be as useful as we think it's going to be in the field? Uh, and so kind of the way we sum it up in our community is that verification answers the question, did we build the thing right? And validation answers the question, did we build the right thing? So you asked about movement between those, those three worlds. Uh, ideally, we like our officers to get exposure to all three of those things during their first few assignments, but it unfortunately rarely works out that way. There's a lot of things that drive assignment process besides just balancing an officer's experience. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and looking at me personally, I spent my first seven years in the Air Force doing none of those things. <laughs> I was actually in, in intelligence squadrons um, doing um, what were quote unquote operational tours, although my previous point still stands because we were actually doing like back end analysis of collected data, but we were rarely never interacting with the operators who were in, out collecting that data. Um, so what, what, what generally happens is in an officer's career, they will naturally get more exposure to one of those worlds than another. And as they become more senior in rank, they'll be groomed for leadership positions in one of those particular uh, areas. And um, as one final note is that uh, most people may not know this, a lot of scientists and engineers in the Air Force, actually when they become field grade officers in the later ranks, will leave the technical community uh, and become acquirers and basically full-time program managers just because the Air Force has a lot more program management jobs to fill than scientists and engineer jobs. Yeah, I was going to say that that was one one area thinking back in my career where I did engage with engineers, but it was when I was doing fighter requirements in the Pentagon and I had to work with uh, the program managers there in acquisitions. So uh, two different uh, worlds, but uh, colliding quite often. Um, Chris, I really want to shift gears here and talk to you about some of your personal work. Um, because what I know about you is you've done a lot of work and have a lot of experience with uh, unmanned aircraft uh, and autonomy. And I know you and I have talked quite a bit about man unmanned teaming and things like that that we're researching at Mitchell. So can you talk to us about how you got into this field? Sure. Uh, it's actually maybe <laughs> kind of a funny story. So around 2012 or so, uh, I just got really into self-driving cars, uh, like not from a professional standpoint, just as a consumer, as a nerd. I just really liked the idea. I liked the technology. Uh, I longed for the day when I could get off work and just sit in my car and veg out to YouTube videos until I got home. So, but the more I read about the technology, the more um, uh, I learned about what different companies were doing and, and, and kind of the maturation process, the more I started to realize that these could be useful for the Air Force as well. Um, you know, obviously the Air Force has had very smart people working on this problem for longer than that, but um, that's just what made it click for me. Um, so at the time I was finishing up my master's in systems engineering and I knew I would be due for a new assignment soon. And so I kind of started thinking maybe there's a way I can, I've got the techno technical background, I've got the interest, maybe there's a way I can get into autonomy uh, for my next assignment. And then, you know, kind of serendipitously, I got an email not long after that from the Air Force Institute of Technology uh, that they had a couple of unfilled PhD slots for their 2018 cohort in aeronautical engineering. So I put an application in and uh, put on my little application essay that I wanted to research autonomous unmanned aircraft and got accepted. So wow, that's incredible. So I ended up doing uh, research on algorithms for teaming. Uh, between unmanned aircraft and persistent intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance missions, and I graduated in 2018. One of the one of the uh, lucky 50% to graduate on time, and ended up at the Air Force Research Labs Aerospace Systems Directorate in 2018. Well, I'm, I'm just you know thinking back, you know, and I initially think about uh, this type of technology was you know initially fielded in you know predator and reaper and what i when i saw them operationally it's like mind-blowing it's science fiction that you've got these airplanes being remotely piloted but you're talking about something on a totally different level uh can you walk us through the basics of how some of this technology works yeah absolutely and uh, reaper by the way is an excellent platform and very good at what it does and i'm glad you brought it up uh, because i think it makes a good data point for a discussion on autonomous aircraft uh, and what you're calling the next level and you can think of that next level as self-driving cars in the sky so 
I know I've spent my year here at Mitchell developing a framework for autonomous aircraft. And shameless plug, that should be a, a, a policy paper that's released here in the next uh, month or two. So hope our listeners we'll definitely will, be looking forward to that one, Chris. Well, we'll give it a download and a read. Um, so, uh, but this this idea came about from uh, my experience in dealing with autonomy in the lab was that autonomy is just this abstract concept and it's really hard to get your arms around, hard for people to understand. And I notice a lot of miscommunication between different stakeholders, specifically from the engineers all the way up to the policymakers, um, just kind of developing a shared language and a shared understanding for what we mean when we say autonomy. So there's a few pieces to the framework, but two of the key ones are establishing levels of autonomy and establishing uh, autonomy categories. So I propose five levels from low automation all the way up to fully autonomous. And with each level, you increase the level of autonomy and you kind of shift the decision-making and control out of a human's hands and into the hands of a, of a machine in, in the form of an artificial intelligence agent. So, so you're kind of back to your uh, self-driving car uh, analogy back, back to the basics. That's right. And, and I, I have to admit that the inspiration came from the Society of Automobile Engineers, um, their kind of framework for how they talk about self-driving cars. So take those levels and set them aside for a moment. We'll get back to them in a second. Uh, the next thing I do is, is break autonomy apart to make the problem a little more digestible. If you just try to talk about how autonomous is a platform as a whole, our platforms have too many functions. They do too many things uh, to kind of adequately describe their level of autonomy in all of those things they do. So to make the problem a little more granular, I break it down into three categories, core, mission, and teaming. So core functions are those, as the name implies, that are common to all aircraft, regardless of their role or their mission. These are uh, two subcategories to this, aviate and navigate. So aviate is keep the airplane in the air, you know, fly within the performance envelope, don't pull so many Gs that you rip the wings off. Navigate is get from point A to point B without hitting anything in between, don't run into any friendly aircraft, and especially for military aircraft, don't get yourself blown up. So uh, the next category is mission. So this is all of the functions associated with the radars, sensors, weapons, and other payloads that allow our aircraft to carry out the doctrinal Air Force missions. So things like offensive counter air or suppression of enemy air defense. And then the third category, teaming, is about how the aircraft shares information in the battle space, both with human and machine teammates, and um, how it cooperates in the battle space to execute the mission. So... Now, if we take those levels of autonomy and pull the pin out of them and bring them back, uh, if you pair those levels of autonomy and you apply a level of autonomy to each of those three core categories, you kind of end up with a table that gives you a rubric that all the stakeholders can use to establish from the the gross kind of level operational behaviors that the aircraft is going to perform. What does it look like? What's the role of the human? How, How automated is it? How autonomous is it? And it creates this shared understanding and shared language between everybody of exactly what we're talking about. Uh, Chris, is this, you know, a technology that's really getting researched now within the Air Force that's new? Or have you guys been working on this for a while? Well, I'm not a historian and and don't plan to be, but I can tell you the story kind of um, as I understand it. Um, AFRL has been involved in this since at least the early 2000s. Uh, If you want to hop on Google, you can look up the X-45 Phantom Ray. Uh, which was a, a Boeing aircraft that was part of an autonomous research and development program back in the early 2000s. Um, okay. I call it the curious case of the X-45. Uh, it's my future book title, so please don't don't steal it. Okay. Um, <laughs> but no, the, in seriousness, this, this program went by many names. It had kind of a troubled life, and at different times it was ran jointly by some combination of DARPA, the Air Force Research Lab, and the Navy. Um, but in 2004, it flew some tests demonstrating some of the very capabilities we're looking at today for our unmanned combat aerial vehicles, uh, the autonomous side of things. Um, It was able to aviate and navigate without human input. It was able to identify and classify pop-up threats. And then it was able to team with another X-45 to to take out those pop-up threats. Uh, And it was able to do this with almost no human input. and so if you think about the time frame of this, 2004, this is pre-smartphone days. Um, so it's really quite advanced what we were doing. 
Unfortunately, uh, the program was canceled in 2006 for a variety of, of technical and, and also some political reasons. Uh, and so after that, the autonomous aircraft kind of went under the radar for a while uh, and, you, and didn't really hear much about it until around 2014 when the Air Force Research Lab started its Loyal Wingman program, which envisioned autonomous, unmanned, fourth-generation aircraft serving as loyal wingmen to traditionally piloted manned fifth-gen aircraft. Um, loyal wingmen, unfortunately, was also canceled um, a few years after it began, but, but it really resulted in a lot of goodness, um, and it developed a cadre of autonomy experts within AFRL that continued to research their, their respective areas so that when the Air Force eventually um, established the Skyborg Vanguard program in 2019, which was de- going to develop an unmanned combat aerial vehicle that was fully autonomous, AFRL was perfectly positioned to jump right on that program and hit the ground running. Well, who instigated this, uh, this technology? Was this, uh, going back to your discussion before, is this uh, a more of a push or more of a pull? And what I mean by that, um, were you guys seeing the potential and you recommended that the Air Force go pursue this because it could you know, up its game, or were you being asked for it by the operators? I would say in its infancy that autonomous aircraft were more of a push from the S&T side. Warfighters, from what I've read in the early days, did not want this. Uh, they did not trust it. They thought it was going to be more of a hindrance than a help. And they just saw it as a bunch of uh, scientists and engineer nerds trying to push some new sleek technology on them that wasn't going to be actually practical for fighting a war. Um, But over the last few years, I I think we've really seen that story change. Um, And and it's definitely become more of a tech pull as 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 combatant commanders look at some of the new challenges and threats they're going to be facing in this in this era of of great power competition, I think they're seeing the the value and the benefit of autonomous aircraft and and the things they can do to help kind of solve some of these problems they're facing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I have, would have to say as a fighter pilot, you know, from a job security standpoint, uh, I, I would have definitely uh, not, not been <laughs> supportive of this initially. But, uh, you know, when you think about um, the capabilities of what airplanes like the F-35 are bringing to the table. I mean, you can just uh, exponentially grow your lethality uh, through something like a a loyal women that uh, I know you're doing a lot of work on. Um, But what are like the biggest technology challenges you and your colleagues are tackling as you work on this? Because I I can just only imagine some of the hurdles that, uh, that, that you're having to overcome. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges. You're right about that. So um, there's kind of two types though. Um, There's the technical challenges which chief among those, I would say, in my opinion, is getting the open system architecture right for these systems. And what I mean by that is that's this idea that the government owns kind of the backbone and the interfaces for the autonomy technology, but uh, in such a way that any vendor who conforms to those interfaces and those data standards can bring their capability and just attach it onto our system and give us this kind of modular plug and play functionality. Uh, And so if you've got a vendor who's selling you widget A that maybe processes data on board the aircraft, and then another vendor comes with widget B, which does the same thing but better, we can just unplug widget A and plug widget B in, and it works. Um, And what that does, there's a couple of advantages. One is it reduces vendor lock, is what we call it, um, so that the Air Force isn't tied to a single vendor for the duration of the system's life cycle. Um, And it allows us to... Um, As new technology comes about, as technology gets better, we can replace functionality with new functionality. And it's good on industry, too, because they can now, instead of losing one contract and and losing out on 10 to 15 years of of profit, um, they know that a new contract is just around the bin. And they also know that that they can knock off another technology by coming up with a better solution. Uh, And also, that modularity provides you with the capability now where you might have a uh, autonomous unmanned aircraft that flies one sortie as an image collector and then it comes back for maintenance and you can quickly swap out its its loadout and, and slap a signals collector on it and for its next sortie it's now a signals intelligence platform. Um, unfortunately that kind of open system architecture, that kind of modularity is much easier said than done. Uh, it's just difficult to get the interfaces right, to get the data standards right. It just takes time to do it. <laughs> it just does. Um, and so that's one type of challenge is a technical challenge. The other type is more of a philosophical challenge, and there's, there's a lot of issues to touch on here. 
But personally, I feel that developing trust between human operators and their machine teammates is is probably the biggest of those philosophical challenges. Um, this is a deep issue, very complex, probably warrants its own podcast. <laughs> uh, and we have a lot of uh, experts looking at this problem. But I'll sum it up for the audience like this. If you have an Alexa or a Siri and you've ever asked it a question and it responds with, sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> now, imagine you're a, a, a pilot in combat and your life depends on this machine understanding what it is you told it to do. Uh, and it responds with something like that. Um, that's what I mean by the issue of trust. If that happens to a pilot in training, how likely are they to rely on that, that, that system, um, that technology while they're in combat? Sure. Yeah. Well, and if I had a, a wingman that said that, at least I know that I could uh, talk to him in the debrief. But if it doesn't happen when you're trying to execute, it's it's got to be uh, it's going to be really frustrating. So absolutely have to fix that before uh, that goes operational. Um, now, and one of the things that I'm thinking about here is uh, is we scratch the surface for what uh, unmanned aircraft can do for air combat, like just thinking we're just scratching the surface, just thinking that we could have an autonomous airplane uh, fly alongside. But it, I, I kind of liken it to uh, the first stages of the space race, right? Just getting to orbit was like the initial challenge. And, uh, you know, we hadn't even begun to think what we we're going to do after we got there. So uh, where do you imagine this technology taking us? Yeah, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head with your, your space race example. So when Sputnik went up, I don't think anyone the next morning, either in the U.S. or the Soviet Union, was thinking, now let's build out satellite navigation. Uh, no, it was uh, a thousand gradual steps that took us from Sputnik to GPS, and it took 40 years or so sure. to, to get there. Um, so I think we'll probably see a, a, a similar development with autonomous aircraft. Hopefully it won't take 40 years, maybe something more like uh, 15, 20 years. Um, but we'll see autonomous aircraft slowly taking over some of the more predictable, mundane jobs currently done by remotely piloted aircraft and manned aircraft. Uh, and then once they've proven themselves out there and the operators have developed some trust, we'll move into some more challenging and dangerous work. Um, maybe having them do something like forward sensing that is kind of skirting enemy threat rings, doing suppression of enemy radars and surface-to-air missiles, um, or acting as a missile truck for our fighters, you know, flying there beside them to provide our fighters with more firepower. And then as our operators get a chance to use and interact with the machines, I think our airmen are going to go and do what they've always done. You know, they're going to be inventive. They're going to come out with new tactics, techniques, and procedures. And then they're going to go one step further and say, well, if I only had one more function on this thing, not only could I do X, but I could do Y and Z too. And they'll hand that over to the S&T Enterprise, and we'll try to make it happen for them. And in 20 or 30 years, I think we'll probably be seeing autonomous aircraft do things that we're not even thinking about today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one thing, as you were talking, I was thinking about private industry because they are obviously doing a, a lot of work in this realm. Um, where do you or do you even partner with uh, private industry and how does that work? How does that partnership work? Yeah, industry is our indispensable partner. And I mean that in every sense of the word. Um, science and technology in general, and autonomy specifically, uh, the problem is just too big for any one government agency or even one company to handle. Um, so you can kind of think of the role of the government as the, the manager and the integrator for technology. We kind of steer the ship and, um, and we tell industry what the warfighter needs. Uh, and we also canvas industry for the, what technology and solutions they have through a process called request for information. So when the warfighter does come to us and say, I need capability X, then we go out to industry and we say, we need to be able to do this. Tell us what you've got. You know, what solutions do you have uh, that might be useful? Uh, on the industry side, they have just an, a very deep pool of expertise and, and they really have the capital and the, and the long-term experience to do the work. You know, I have to say that there are many in government and civilian life who go to industry and there are many retired and separated officers who end up working in the defense industrial base and it goes the other way too some people leave the defense industrial base and come to the government side to work uh, and and so industry is acutely aware of the kind of the most current and relevant problems that the department of defense is facing uh, and actually there is tech push from industry as well uh, through a process called internal research and development or irad um, and that's where the company says we're going to spend our own dollars, our own profit, uh, to develop some technology solution that we think is going to be useful to the Air Force, and then they come try and sell it to us. And, uh, and you know, we love it when industry is innovative like that. 
Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, now, I'm going to throw one at you, and I don't want you to speak to anything classified, but big picture, um, how do we know where our adversaries are uh, with their own race to this technology? Um, and are you all generally aware of what they're doing or have a pacing indicator to ensure that we, the United States, are on track and we're not surprised by uh, our adversaries getting this technology first? Yeah, of course. Uh, we, I like to say we like to make sure our toys are better than their toys. Um, so uh, I do have to be careful, uh, but I am an avid poker player. Uh, and, you know, we can think about when you're playing poker, you, good players don't just think about the cards in their hand. Uh, they're thinking about what cards are, are yet to be played that their opponents could be holding. Uh, they think about how their opponents are betting. They think about how they played previous hands. Have they been aggressive? Have they been passive? Um, and so in the S&T community, we're not just looking at our own cards. Um, we want to know two things. We want to know what is the state of maturity for our adversaries in terms of the key technological areas and what kind of capabilities might they be developing to kind of negate the advantage we're hoping to get <laughs> from our technologies. All right, Chris, I know we're... Uh we're talking quite a bit here and getting short on time. So I've got one last question for you. What does the future Air Force engineer look like to you from a human capital perspective? Because we're talking about really big challenges on the different types of technologies that are being developed and how everything is evolving. So what sort of attributes uh, are increasingly important to you uh, and uh, to your teammates? Well, I'll, I'll start with this story. Uh, when I was an undergrad at, at Texas A&M, we used to have recruiters come in all the time to talk to the students in the engineering school about what they were looking for. And without fail, the reps always said communication skills. And that always kind of frustrated me as an engineering student because I, I wanted to hear them say, like, we're looking for people really good at uh, solving differential equations or, or, um, or, or programming in, in Java or C or something like that. But they never said that. It was always communication. Uh, and you know, I, now looking back over the last 13 years, I have to agree that, that they're absolutely right. Um, communication skills is the number one thing, and especially in s and because the world is getting more complex, and the ability to take a complex problem and break it down into the most relevant parts and then come up with a solution uh, that, that follows a logical uh, kind of thinking and then convey that, that solution and the, that thinking to senior leaders and to peers – is just an invaluable skill. Uh, so that's the number one thing. The other thing you, uh, I've heard other, um, I've heard senior leaders in the Air Force talk about is, is digital natives. So as we're looking at this new crop of scientists and engineers entering the workforce, uh, we're really excited to have have people that grew up in a world where they had the smartphones, they had the touch screens, they have cloud technology, uh, social media, those sorts of things, and they just are digital natives. They they speak that language and they understand how to use that technology uh, just naturally to solve problems. And the other thing I would say is what I alluded to earlier, is, is getting scientists and engineers who speak fluent geek, but are also functional in uh, the language of the warfighter. Um, or sometimes I say they need to be journeymen in terms of the operational perspective, and they need to be masters in terms of the science and technology perspective. Well, Chris, I, I can't say thank you enough for taking your time to be here. And I learned a ton and I'm sure our listeners are really going to enjoy uh, the conversation with you. And, uh, you know, we often take a lot of new technology for granted. And it appears, you know, sometimes that we just see it at the unit at the unit level. Uh, and it's really important that we understand that there are people like you that are pushing really hard behind the scenes to make it happen. Uh, and I also want to just throw out one last thank you for being part of the Mitchell team this past year. It's been really, really fun to work with you and learn from you. And, and of course, uh, on all the autonomy pieces and man on man teaming, I mean, uh, you're really putting your thumbprint on what the future of the Air Force is going to be in this realm. Thanks for that, Slick, and, and thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Uh, this has been really fun, actually. And uh, uh, before I go, I just wanted to express my appreciation to you and the entire Mitchell staff uh, for letting me be here this year and work. And, and thank you all for what you do every day for um, educating the public and advocating for air and space power. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to you, our listeners, for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hammer down on that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment for us to let us know what you think about our show or areas you would like to hear more about. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And you can always find us at MitchellAerospacePower.org. 
Until next time, this is John Slickbaum. Stay safe and check six.